Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 6th of July, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So, so the Sepolia testnet merge is happening very, very soon. It probably is in the middle of happening or already happened by the time you have watched this. this is, of course, going to be the live stream with the Eat Staker crew and myself. Uh, I'm sure by the time, I think by the time this goes out, it'll either be kind of like the end of the live stream or like half, maybe even halfway through it or something like that. Um, but you can obviously watch the recording back uh, kind of like later on, like after you've finished watching this or whatever. Uh, and I'm super excited for it. I mean, this is this is two thirds of the way there, guys, like to, to mainnet merge. After Sepolia is girly uh, and that's it. And then we have mainnet. Like there's nothing else planned after that. Everything has gone through quite smoothly so far no major issues in terms of like merge related issues or consensus related issues a lot of things seem to be just non-merge related and, and non-consensus related which is what we want to see of course and there's more shadow forks happening i believe that shadow fork 8 went through quite smoothly i saw today i think there was only an, an issue with aragon nodes uh, um or i think that they weren't synced or something like that i can't remember exactly what was said i read it in the um the core dev uh, kind of like Discord, but I think uh, there was maybe uh, 10, 15 percent of the network, which was the Aragon nodes that were kind of like um, not synced or something like that. And then, yeah, there wasn't any big merge related issues or anything like that, which is very awesome to see. But yeah, if you want to ke keep up to date with, I guess, like the Sepolia testnet uh, merge and how it all went, uh, I guess like we'll know that it went through successfully or not. Uh, you'll probably know by now by the time you're watching this, but I'm sure there'll be postmortems and things like that and reports that come out. Uh, after maybe like 12 to 24 hours after it happens. Uh, I'm just super excited for it. So I guess it's probably already happened by the time you watch this. So hopefully it went well. All right, so Xiaowei Wang here from uh, the Ethereum Foundation has uploaded uh, her presentations of the Ethereum Layer 1 R&D workshop at uh, DevConnect here. So you can go to this forum here and the presentations covered the most important R&D topics such as dank sharding, PBS, statelessness, and more. So this is the stuff that you want to be watching and, and kind of like uh, uh, reading and, and kind of paying attention to if you want to get into like the deepest weeds of Ethereum core protocol development, this is the bleeding edge guys. Like this sort of stuff is, is stuff that is years out, right? Like it's, it's just kind of like in research phase right now. And then obviously it'll move on, on, keep iterating from there and then move on to the development phase. And then obviously, hopefully it goes into the network and kind of becomes part of the mainnet Ethereum. But this kind of like stuff includes, you know, EIP 4844, which is proto dank sharding. Uh, dank sharding in general, L2 resource pricing, right? Um, uh, kind of like other things like uh, statelessness as, as Xiaowei Wang mentioned and, and a bunch of other really, really cool things here. So if you're interested in, in kind of watching those talks and, and, and checking out the slides and everything, I'll link this in the YouTube description for you and you can check it out below. All right, so speaking of the Ethereum Foundation, the EF research team will host a Reddit AMA on July 7th at 1 p.m. UTC. This is about 24 hours after the Sepolia testnet merge timing, which I guess is the point, right? They, they, they want to kind of like do this AMA after a major kind of event has happened, which was the Sepolia testnet merge. So if you have questions, definitely go to this thread. I'll link it in the YouTube description below and you can ask your questions in the thread here. These AMAs are usually really, really good and really, really full of insight. They've done a bunch of these, you know, as this is the eighth here. They've done seven previous ones and they do them semi-regularly. I think it happens maybe every, on a kind of like every five to six month cadence here, as you can see from from the dates. And it's just a really good way to ask the kind of like people on the bleeding edge of Ethereum any question that you would like. And they're usually very, very good about answering most of the questions, if not all of them that are asked in the thread. So definitely go and ask your questions. And of course, once the AMA is complete and they've answered all the questions, you can go read all their answers, which I'm sure will be packed full of alpha. There's no, I mean, there's no, really no one kind of like, I guess, deeper in the weeds than the Ethereum Foundation research team in terms of kind of like Ethereum core protocol development. This is where it starts, guys. Like it doesn't start at the development phase, obviously. It starts at the research phase and everything has started there. The proof of stake, sharding, AIP-1559, like everything that you've ever kind of like heard of, every major upgrade has started in the research phase, been iterated on over time and made its way into the network. So if you paid attention since kind of like the research phase, you got to basically see it evolve over time and see everything come together nicely, which is actually really cool. I've paid attention to pretty much every major upgrade since I got into Ethereum and, and from like the research side to the development side. And it's really, really awesome to see just how kind of, I guess, like, how it all comes together, right, at the end of the day. So, yeah, ch check out this AMA. Ask your own questions if you have them. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. 
All right, so another, I guess, Ethereum or Web3 related uh, mobile phone news today. And I just saw this uh, kind of like, I guess, a few hours ago, and I hadn't heard of this before, but basically... This account called at Ethereum Phone has released a the first build of ETHOS, which I guess stands for Ethereum Operating System, and they're they're claiming that ETHOS is easy to install, updates over the air, features an onboard light node, and you can install it on a Pixel 3 or 5a. I'm sure you, I think you can install this on basically any modern Android phone, but if you go to EtheriumPhone.org, basically what you'll see here is kind of like the kind of link to install it yourself here. So a mobile operating system built to be crypto native. And this is kind of like the features that, they, that they're planning on kind of like having or adding. So native dApps, uh, 0% platform fees, crypto widgets, a local light node. I talked about light clients the other day and light nodes, crypto native payments uh, and an ENS integration as well. I'm sure among other features. Now, what this is basically an op like a whole new operating system for your phone. Obviously stuff like this can't really be installed on iPhones. Uh, I'm not even sure if like people even bother jailbreaking iPhones these days. It, it seems to be a much smaller community than it once was. But Android, it's uh, it used to be called like rooting your Android phone, which was basically getting kind of like root access to the phone in order to upload or install your own operating system on it. Well, that's exactly what um, a ethos is trying to do here, which is, I think, pretty cool. I discussed yesterday about, you know, Polygon partnering with HTC on their Metaverse phone, and obviously Solana has their own phone initiative and things like that. I think there is definitely going to be a battle here, and, and there's definitely going to be something that comes out of it. As I mentioned yesterday, I am way less bullish. I'm actually pretty bearish on teams that are trying to do their own hardware. Um, even if they're working with a third third party, it's kind of like... You know, it's kind of like hard to do hardware just generally, but also I think that if you do software, it means you can kind of like install it on the existing devices that are already out there, the existing hardware that's already out there. Now, obviously, Ethereum OS is taking it to the extreme where you can install an entirely new OS on the phone in order to get like a mobile, for, I mean, sorry, crypto first mobile or crypto native mobile experience, which I guess most people aren't going to do, but like maybe the more hardcore people will do. And also just a note on that as well. I haven't looked at this software. I don't know anyone who has, so I don't know if it's kind of like legit or if it has a backdoor in it or whatever. So I wouldn't be storing any significant funds on this or anything just yet. I wouldn't be putting much money into it at all. But if you do want to try it out, you can, of course. But I guess um, that's just like, like an aside to what I was just saying before. But I think, you know, the software side of things is going to be much more impactful than the hardware side. And it doesn't have to be an entirely new OS. It can be specific apps. It can be specific integrations with existing software. I mean, Android itself and 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 it's and the and the popular flavors of, of Android like that the manufacturers put on it, such, such, such as Samsung, can embed their own crypto wallet. And I'm tr pretty sure Samsung did at one point. I'm not sure what happened with that. Uh, and same with kind of like Apple, they can embed things into Apple Pay. I'm, I think they did or they were looking at it. They can embed things directly into the iPhone because the iPhone has a... a, a so basically what the iPhone has is essentially what kind of like a hardware wallet has where it has a separate kind of um, a chip for all your, I guess, passwords and authentication and things like that. So you can technically have a private key that lives on that chip and no one would be able to see that and you'd be able to use your mobile device as kind of like a, a Web3 wallet, like natively without having to install a different kind of like a wallet software on it. So all that sorts of stuff is really cool. But again, obviously it relies on Apple integrating that at the iOS level, and it would require one of the manufacturers or Android itself doing it on the on the um kind of like OS level, or you could install ETHOS and it's all there for you. And the good the cool thing about Android is that you can install these custom OSs and still have access to the App Store, like the, the Google Play Store. You can still install and still install the apps from it. The only issue is that you know the compatibility issues between this new OS and the apps that you install and things like that. So that's definitely a potential blocker there. But still cool to see people experimenting with this. I mean, this sort of stuff has been talked about for a while now. Like, I, like I'd have to be five or six years at this point in terms of having like a Web3 phone or Web3 operating system. And there's been various attempts over time. And I think it really comes down to the fact that we just need more experiments in the ecosystem. We just need more people kind of, I guess, like giving it a go. But I think that the success is, if, if it's ever, if, if, if there's going to be success here, it's, it's just going to be seen on the software layer. I don't think there's going to be much success on the, on the kind of like hardware layer, because as I described yesterday, or as I explained yesterday, the hardware game is like totally different to the software game. It's, it's, it's very, very much, uh, very, very uh, hard uh, and not just hard from a kind of like a supply chain perspective, but also just building the network effect, breaking even, you know, cost efficiency, all that stuff that I, that I mentioned yesterday there, but just wanted to kind of like highlight this today because I thought it was interesting.
thing. And as I said, you can go install this. I mean, you could install this on some just like cheap Android phone if you just wanted to play around with it. If you didn't want to screw around with your own Android phone and, and replace your existing OS, you can essentially just install this on a really cheap Android phone that you could probably get off Amazon or eBay or something like that and play around with it. Or I, I think you could even install it on like an emulator, an Android emulator on uh, on your PC as well if you wanted to play around with it. But as I said, I wouldn't be using this as a daily driver yet. And I also wouldn't be storing any significant amount of money in this because you just can't trust it at this point because I, I just saw it. I don't know much about it. So I can't be recommending it to, to, to you guys yet, but I just thought it was interesting to, to see that this is out there. All right, so Bartek from the L2 Beat team has published uh, a proposal on the L2 Beat uh, forum for a bridge at risk framework. So they obviously want to get community feedback on this framework, and it's been something that they've been working on for quite a while now. I remember talking about it when they were teasing it. Uh, basically, they want to do what they did for our layer twos in general on L2 Beats for bridges in terms of like, getting a risk framework up and running, making users aware of kind of the trade-offs of each bridge, how they work, what the risks are, you know, are there admin keys, are there centralized controls, all these sorts of stuff. And I think it's an, an awesome effort that needs to kind of like be done because obviously bridges are very, very popular these days and they're only getting more popular as time goes on, but not all bridges are created equal. I'll, pretty much all of them have major differences between each other. And I think people, some people kind of like equate bridges with each other. Like, oh, you know, this bridge lets me do this and this bridge lets me do do this as well. Oh, they must be the same thing. When in reality, different bridges work in different ways. Like I've, I've spoken extensively about bridges before, right? There's kind of like cross-chain uh, or cross-L2 uh, exchanges, which act as kind of like bridges. And then there's just simply kind of like sending it across and... Um, there's kind of like a system that just like signs the transactions and issues you IOUs on different chains and they may be controlled by multi-sigs and stuff like that. So there are various different bridge designs out there. Uh, and that's, I think, what the L2 Bridge Risk Framework wants to do is that they want to centralize, oh, centralize. They, they want to centralize the information around all these bridges into one easy to digest kind of like a, a resource for people so that people know exactly what they're kind of like getting into. And you can actually see the different kind of like uh, messaging bridges, they call them here, um, you know, in more detail, such as kind of like light client verifying, external validator set, optimistic validation, and hybrid. So this post itself is actually pretty informative. If you want to learn about a little more about bridges, I would highly recommend checking it out, but also get involved with the conversation if you have any kind of like, um, any kind of uh, uh, thoughts on this as well. And actually, I didn't I didn't see this just before, but there seems to be a table here with all of the bridges or at least all the known bridges and kind of like what they're using for verification, their mechanism and the trusted entities and the trust assumptions. This is really cool. This is exactly what the framework will end up looking like, probably in a, in a nicer format, but it's essentially what you see on my screen here, where you see different kind of bridges such as, you know, the Binance Smart Chain Bridge, uh, from Ethereum to BSC is is verification is done externally. It's lock and mint, which means lock it on Ethereum and you get issued an IOU or minted an IOU on BSC. It has an external validator set that you have to trust, which is the BSC validator set. Uh, and then the same is true for a lot of these things here. And then you can see kind of like these generalized bridges that we've used, such as Hop and Connext. Uh, verification is done locally on Hop. Uh, mechanism is liquidity providers, so it's that kind of uh, decentralized exchange that I was talking about. And the trusted entities is obviously liquidity here. And you can see all the different ones. I'm not going to read through them all, but this is, I think, a really really cool little table here that will actually save you a lot of time and effort and and worry, kind of no, uh, trying to fi fi kind of like figure out what the bridge is, how they're secured, what you know, what the risk is, all that sorts of stuff. So I can't wait to see this live on the L2B website. I think this is going to be an, an amazing resource for people just like i think that the l2b website in general is an amazing resource for people because it lets you know the risks and i talk about the risks a lot on the refuel around everything not just decentralized things not just DeFi, but obviously cfi and, and centralized services and stuff like that like at the end of the day I wouldn't be putting any significant amount of money into something that I didn't know how it worked. I used to do it when I was more of a cowboy in DeFi summer. Like I was a bit harder and looser there, but I've definitely kind of like uh, uh, matured since then and definitely taken risk a lot more seriously. And now when I look at something, I kind of like hesitate. I'm like, mm, do I really want to put my money into this thing? Like how much do I trust it? And it's, you know, I'm not kind of like aping my funds into fresh yield farms anymore. Not that there really is anything like that at the moment, but just generally I'm not doing that. Like I'll go put my, if I'm doing something, I'll put it into a protocol that I know is kind of uh, very secure, been around for a while, uh, has a team that's not going to rug or anything like that, such as kind of like Uniswap or, or Maker or Curve, Compound, Aave, you know, all, all the popular ones, right? Those are the kind of things that I would probably put my money into uh, if I if I was going to use something like DeFi on chain. But there are a lot of stuff out there that I just wouldn't touch. And especially when it comes to bridges as well, I don't 
really like bridging into different things uh, and bridging out of it using these third-party bridges at this stage just because of the fact that they're very early, there's still risks involved. Um, and if I was doing a significant value transfer, then I definitely would not be using any bridge. Like if I was going from Ethereum layer one to Optimism and I wanted to transfer, significant is relative. Like, it, you know, obviously $1,000 is more significant to uh, some person than, than, than other people. But say I wanted to transfer... A ten thousand dollars or something to the optimism from Ethereum layer one. I would personally go through the optimism bridge itself, uh, the bridge contract. I wouldn't go through one of these third parties. And same is true for going back. Now I know there's that seven day delay when you go through the the, um, the kind of like natural bridge there, but I would account for that. Oh, sorry, the native bridge there, but I would account for that personally. And it just depends. Obviously, as I said, the amount is relative. Uh, but these bridges will become more secure over time. They'll become more trustless. They'll become they'll have less centralized points of failure. But we're not there yet. Obviously, all this stuff is very early, uh, and that's why we need things like the bridge risk framework here in order to enable users to know exactly what the risks are that they're taking. So check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. So Awoki shared some really cool stats here from Gitcoin. So in Q2 of 2022, Gitcoin facilitated $9.4 million in value transfer across a bunch of different categories here. Bounties, tips, grants, kudos, ads, and ecosystem. Now, obviously, the top two is uh, kind of like grants and uh, and I think tips. These colors are kind of like weird here. It's either tips or bounties. Uh, these colors are all very similar on on my screen, it's 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 kind of like weird to see, but um, grants obviously is accounted for like the major, I guess like revenue of of Gitcoin, uh, or I guess like the main kind of like value transfer. I shouldn't say revenue, value transfer of Gitcoin for a long time now. But it seems that I think that's tips because it's I think bounties is in is in a darker color here. But it seems like I, I don't know for sure, but it seems that tips or bounties is accounting for about half, and grants is accounting for about half now as well, which is cool. I mean, it means there's more diversity in the value transfer here on Gitcoin. It's not just all centralized in grants. We obviously don't want it to just be mostly grants. We want Gitcoin to be more than 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 the grants rounds uh sorry then the grants thing uh the grants product in general we want gitcoin to fund open source software as much as it can and you can see here to in total there's been 65 million dollars of funding for open source software i mean that's huge guys like there, like open source software is usually something that go, gets very, very underfunded or not funded at all. And there are many, many instances of very, very pro popular open source products and open source software products and and um and kind of like uh, a code in general that has been used by major companies, you know, billion trillion dollar companies and these companies don't actually pay anything and don't maintain these sorts of things and don't kind of like pay the people that are maintaining this software they just use it because it's something very popular to use uh, and then, and then what happens up happening is that the, the the developers or the maintainers of that software may be like, well, I don't want to maintain this anymore. Like I, they have no obligation to. And then uh, some people kind of like, or some companies are like, oh crap, we actually need this. We really need this. And then they kind of like have their oh shit moment. Whereas doing a more sustainable kind of like way of funding open source software, which is what Gitcoin's mission is, is definitely much, much, much better because it basically pays people for doing the work and for maintaining things and for and, and kind of rewarding them for their important work, for things that people care about. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of like uh, teams, a lot of projects on Gitcoin grants these days. But I think the classic example is the Ethereum core teams, right? They get money from various different sources, but generally they need to kind of like find their own funding. And grants is one way to do that. And they're providing a shit ton of value for the network. Like you know, They're building the things that drive value value directly to ETH. I mean, they built 1559 that's driving direct value directly to ETH. They're doing the merge, which is obviously very bullish for ETH. So they should be paid for their work in, and, and, and I think honestly, like that payment could come from the Ethereum foundation, which already pays them and other entities. But I think it's really cool that individuals get to have an impact here, especially in the matching rounds where they can basically give like one to $10 and have that matched a lot more and have their donation go a lot, lot further than it otherwise would have to public, you know, open source software here. So very, very cool to see Gitcoin having such amazing growth. Uh, I hope it continues. All right, so a tweet from Polynar today. I don't think I've um, talked about Polynar in a little while. I remember there was a time where I think for like a whole week on every refuel, I had Polynar tweets up, but uh, they're not tweeting as much these days, but whenever they do, it's always a banger. So they put out another one today where they said, Endgame. EVM slash VM ASICs for roll-up sequences. Orders of magnitude faster versus any multi-threaded virtual machine. Stateless and expiring. Multiple sequences composing to a single validity proof roll-up and users and validators verify validity proofs on CPU without requiring, requiring recomputation on ASICs. 
Okay. This sort of stuff is like getting into the very nitty gritty of, uh, I guess, like layer twos or validity proof rollups as, as kind of like Polynyak calls them here. But essentially what they are saying is that the, the, the end game, like long into the future, or maybe not too long into the future, but kind of like over the longer term, we definitely want to see ASICs repurposed to become roll-up sequencers. So what they would do as a roll-up sequencer is that they kind of like run these proofs. You know, the most expensive part and most time-consuming part of a validity proof roll-up or a ZK roll-up is the proving costs and the proving time. Now, to get that down, you can use things like ASICs, uh, the application-specific integrated circuits, which is what is used, obviously, in proof-of-work today. But using them uh, as a sequencer doesn't require you to burn enormous amounts of electricity because it's a different thing. It, it, in proof of work, you're basically uh, competing in like a worldwide lottery and guessing kind of, and like hashing to guess the the right kind of like, uh, 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 right, uh, get, get, guess the right guess, I guess, or guess the right guy, right thing that you need for, to, to kind of like produce a block there. Uh, but basically as, uh, as a sequencer, it's not doing any of that sorts of stuff. It's just processing the kind of like, um, transactions and, ver and, and, and running the proof and all that sorts of stuff there. So obviously there's no massive electricity cost here. So I think that's really cool that we can repurpose ASICs hopefully, or kind of like have the ASIC manufacturers, Got kind of build ASICs for ZK rollups for validity proof rollups, and then doing multiple sequences composing to a single validity proof rollup would be very cool as well. And then users, users and validators verify the validity proofs on their own CPU without re, without requiring recomputation on ASIC. So basically, the ASIC does all the heavy lifting, and then the CPU from any device, smartphone, laptop, PC, doesn't matter what it is, would be able to verify the validity of these proofs. So verify that they're correct uh, without having to do the whole computation themselves without having to do the intensive work themselves. So as I said, this sort of stuff is very technical down in the weeds. Like I'm not going to say I'm an expert on this far from it, but I think this is stuff that you can look into if you're into the hardware side of crypto. If you want to know what the future of ASICs looks like, especially in the Ethereum ecosystem, obviously ASIC miners are still going to exist within Bitcoin. They're not changing for proof of work uh, for a while, if ever. I say for a while because I do think there is a reality where they do have a proof of stake uh, Bitcoin. It may be a fork. It may not be the Bitcoin, but uh, I, 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 I think that it could happen eventually. But just generally, ASICs are still going to be Bitcoin. You know, a Bitcoin thing is going to be for Bitcoin proof of work, but they're also going to be a roll-up thing, specifically with ZK roll-ups that have very high proving costs and take a long time. Uh, by, by putting an ASIC to it, we could get those costs dramatically down and the time also down dramatically there. So yeah, that's it on that one. You can go check out the thread. I think the, there's not really many replies here, uh, but there are there is another thread linked here about recursive snarks if you wanted to read that as well. All right, so uh, Voyager, the troubled kind of like crypto services or centralized crypto service provider um, today, uh, kind of like put out a thread or at least the CEO, Stephen or Stephen here put out a thread talking about what the recovery plan is for Voyager. So there, there's one tweet in particular that I wanted to focus on. And for those of you who don't know, Voyager basically bankrupted themselves by lending out, I think $600 million or something to 3 Iris Capital obviously didn't get that paid back because three hours capital blew themselves up. And I think Voyager has like $200, $250 million worth of assets left. So unfortunately, customers took the hit here. And I, I quote tweeted the, this tweet. And this is the tweet that Stephen, oh, Stephen put out here where he says, customers with crypto in their accounts will receive in exchange a combination of the crypto in their accounts, proceeds from the three hours capital recovery, common shares in the newly reorganized company and Voyager tokens. So basically the the loss is being socialized to the customers of Voyager, which really, really sucks. Like, and that's why I said, like, I feel very sorry for Voyager customers. This is fucked up. Just another reminder to not leave any funds you care about on centralized exchanges slash services. Uh, don't do it guys. Like honestly, not your keys, not your coins. I know that's been around forever, but it's so true. Like if you had left your funds in Voyager, you are now basically getting this, I don't know what another word for it, this orgy of kind of like crap, basically. Like <laughs> you get some of the crypto in your account. You get some of the proceeds from the three hours capital recovery, if that ever comes. You get common shares in the newly reorganized company, which would probably not be worth very much. And you get some Voyager tokens, which again, aren't worth very much because they had all dumped because of the fact that the news came out that Voyager kind of like screwed themselves. I really hate this. And like the reason I hate this is because at the end of the day, like customers and, and users, uh, most of, if not all of them, and pretty much all of them are innocent. They shouldn't be taking the, I guess, like a brunt of this. So they shouldn't be taking the punishment here. 
But the problem is that Voyager literally doesn't have the money to cover all their obligations to their customers. So they have to do this. So that's why don't keep any significant funds on these centralized services or exchanges. There is a spectrum here. Obviously, Voyager is very different to something like a Coinbase. But at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter who it is. If you don't control your keys, you don't control your coins. Like it doesn't matter how trustworthy the, 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 the person is or the organization is that holds your crypto for you. It, it, that doesn't matter at all. Like unless you control your own fate, you're at the whims of them. And it's the same is true for like banks and stuff too. Like if you put your money in a bank and there's been instances of this around the world, put your money in a bank and then the bank starts having troubles or the economy or the government starts having troubles or there's like rampant inflation or there's a bank run. Like you, there, there's no guarantee you have access to your, you'll get access to your funds, right? So it's not just a crypto thing. It's a, just a general thing. And we have this beautiful thing of self so, uh, self-sovereignty or being able to kind of hold your own money and, and being able to self-custody and people take take that for granted. People put their money into these centralized services to earn some yield. They're like, oh, I can earn like 10% on my stable coins or 10% on my or 5% on my ETH and Bitcoin. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you can earn that, but then you have a hundred percent chance of risk, of custodial risk, which is basically this this kind of like organization can uh, go run away with your funds, go bankrupt, get hacked, any of that sorts of stuff. Whereas with self-custody, I don't actually think it's very it's difficult to self-custody at all. I mean, like there are different ways to do it. Even just self-custodying on a hot wallet is probably better than putting it on a centralized exchange, uh, at least mo most of these centralized exchanges and services. But again, it is a spectrum. I mean, hot wallets themselves are, are inherently insecure too. So I'm not trying to say that they're secure, but in my mind, like uh, uh, most of these centralized exchanges and services are more risky than that. And that's saying something, right? If it's more risky than a hot wallet, then it must be very, very risky. Whereas there is obviously cold wallets and cold storage and hardware wallets and all that sorts of stuff that you can do as well. A little bit more complicated, for the everyday user, but like, come on, like, does it, like, if you can't be bothered learning how to use a hardware wallet or learning how to kind of like get your funds onto a hardware wallet and you have a significant amount of money in crypto, well, then honestly, I just think that's that's pure laziness because if you don't care enough to secure your funds, if you're fine risking your funds on these centralized services, that's totally your decision. But at the end of the day, if you just took a little bit of time to learn how to self custody and learn the importance of that, you would have saved you, you would potentially save yourself so much heartache down the line. So I think in the future, I really hope that more people kind of like heed these warnings, more people kind of like realize these sorts of stuff. Maybe they won't, probably they won't. And I think really at, at the end of the day, what's coming to these centralized exchanges and services is extremely harsh regulation. It's probably going to be just as harsh as what banks have, if not harsher than that. Uh, and that's what's going to kind of like curb this sort of stuff. There's going to be obviously audits and stuff. There's going to be uh, regulations applied to, to these companies and all that sorts of stuff there, there as well. But just generally, I would prefer if we just kind of like had people custody their own funds and I controlled their own keys. But I know that that may not be a scalable way for mass adoption either, but it can be if we get better solutions. Obviously, something like a smart contract wallet that, that Argent's working on where you can have like... um a social recovery and stuff like that. Like that definitely is getting us better towards the path of, of enabling more and more people to self-custody and to, for them to do it easily. But just in general, I mean, if you're listening to the refuel, like you're, you're in the weeds. To me, all the refuel listeners and watchers are in the weeds of crypto, Ethereum, everything that has to do with it. If you have any significant amount of money, not in a hardware wallet, like just literally go buy one right now, like go buy a, a Lattice One, go buy a Ledger, whatever hardware, hardware wallet you want. Um, go buy one and then move your crypto to it and make sure you secure it obviously properly and secure your seed phrase properly and everything like that. Because like it starts with us guys, like it starts with the enthusiast at the end of the day. And then we can kind of like put that message out there and, and, and educate other people about it as well. But yeah, very, very, I feel very sorry. As I said, for Voyager customers here, Unavo it was avoidable for them if they didn't have their funds there. But unfortunately, Voyager just doesn't have the money to pay everyone back. So there's really nothing they can do um, uh, at the end of the day. But they are trying to push some blame onto kind of 3 Hours Capital here with this tweet, which I thought was funny as well. But they're solely to blame here. Voyager, the company, for lending out all that money in an undercollateralized fashion or an uncollateralized fashion to 3 Hours Capital was absolute stupidity. Really, really dumb. Uh, not even in just in hindsight, just generally. Even if Three Hours Capital was legit, lending out that much money to of your balance sheet to uh, and in an uncollateralized way to a, a kind of like um, a fund that you know trades it is just stupid in my eyes. But I think that was just kind of like one of the ways that Voyager was uh, was kind of like offering the yield to their customers because Three Hours Capital would have been like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll pay you you know, this amount of kind of like interest on this. And then they kind of like pass that to their customers and promised all this yield and all that kind of like other stuff. But yeah, not pretty 
feel sorry for people there. But uh, but yeah, I think that's it for, for that one there. And I think that's it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.